I'm Mark Appleman. I'm the executive director of SABRE, Society for American Baseball Research. We're an organization of over 6,000 members, passionate baseball fans who love everything from the history to the statistics of baseball. We're excited to be here today with BAM to be presenting this panel. It's Women in Baseball, and Amanda Rykoff from ESPNW is the moderator, and she'll introduce our esteemed panelists. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, I'm Amanda Rykoff. I'm a contributor to ESPNW.com, which is ESPN's website uh, and online destination for female sports fans and athletes. Um, I write about many sports, but I focus on baseball, so I'm really delighted to be here today at FanFest. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let me introduce um, our esteemed panelists. Uh, I have directly to my left, Leslie Heafy. She is a professor of history at Kent State University and chairman of the Women in Baseball Committee for mm -hmm. Sabre. Uh, she's written extensively on the history of women in the sport of baseball, and in 2006, she published the Encyclopedia of Women in Baseball, which is a comprehensive work on the women involved in the game as owners, players, managers, and writers. Uh, directly to Leslie's left is Wendy Lewis. Wendy Lewis is, uh, has 25 years in baseball. <laughs> she is the Senior Vice President of Diversity and Strategic Alliances for Major League Baseball in the Office of the Commissioner in New York. Uh, she has been in New York since 1995 mm -hmm. and along the way has steered several initiatives geared towards diversity in the workplace. Uh, most notably, she manages the leadership of MLB's Diverse Business Partners Program. It's the leading supplier diversity program in sports which has resulted in more than $800 million being spent with thousands of minority and women-owned ba uh, businesses check, 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 around baseball. Check, 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 uh, check, finally, check, on the far left, check, uh, or far right on, check, from your perspective, check, is Justine Siegel. Check, Justine Siegel is the founder and executive director of Baseball for All. Check, She's also check, the director of sports check, partnerships at the Sport check, and Society at Northeastern University. Uh, Justine has a, a long and storied career uh, working on the field in baseball as well as off. She was an assistant baseball coach for Springfield College from 2007 to 2010. She was the first woman to serve in as, as an assistant coach in uh, uh, for a professional baseball team when she was hired as the first base coach of the independent league Brockton Rocks in 2009. And last year, uh, you may remember when Justine was the first woman to toss batting practice at spring training for several major league teams, including the Indians, the A's, the Rays, the Cardinals, the Astros, and the Mets. So welcome, everyone. Um, we've got about an hour, and we'll talk. We'll, we've got a few topics that we'll talk about. And then with about 20 minutes left, we'll open it up for questions from the audience. So just if you have anything that you want to ask along the way, just make a note, write it down, tweet it. And, uh, and we'll, we'll try to get to it um, at the end. So uh, let's start with Leslie. Okay. Uh, you literally wrote the book on women and baseball. So just uh, tell us a little bit about why you wanted to, to write that, you know, that kind of that definitive piece and some of the surprises along the way as you researched and, and wrote it. Well, I wanted to approach the idea because it's a story that most people don't necessarily know about beyond the All-American League. And there's such a rich history and it goes so far back and it's important for people to understand I thought the larger picture and for women to have opportunities to see that there's a past and that there have been women involved in baseball from the very beginning it's not something that is new it's not something that they're asking and wanting just now but it's always been there and as a historian that was important to me um, and so I wanted to take the approach to say we need to start writing some of this history down there's a lot of it out there. We've never really tried in a concerted effort. And I knew that it wasn't going to be the be all and end all, but you have to start somewhere. And so I thought if I could get the information down, it would allow people to see what we knew and more importantly, how much we still didn't know and be able to begin to fill in the blanks, which is what we're continuing to do. And what I discovered was what I thought I knew was just the tip of the iceberg, and there are so many stories going back, fascinating ones, particularly in the early stages, 19th century kinds of stories, um, early 20th century stories of young ladies playing. And just real quick, my favorite one that is the story about Jackie Mitchell striking out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, uh, which is you know, as a 17-year-old, which is not a story most people know anything about. Um, how has the role of women in the game evolved over the years? Um, I think the, the role has 
ebbed and flowed. It has grown at some point. Um, there's been a lot of focus on the idea of women as baseball players historically, but the role, and I think you see it here, is so much greater than that. And we have to think about women in, in all aspects of baseball. And that's the part that I think has evolved and continues to evolve, um, though there's a great deal more to do in that area. Um, just, I mean, just to follow up, Wendy, um, obviously one thing that is so critical to your role at Major League Baseball is making sure that women have opportunities kind of behind the scenes in the supplier role. So talk a little bit, you know, kind of following up on what Leslie was just talking about, how there is this tremendous opportunity for women in ways that you don't necessarily see. I would agree and applaud the work and research uh, that you've already done. It's amazing. But women need to know that in terms of the pipeline that uh, has been there and continued to be developed around workforce as well as supply chain, the whole supplier diversity component uh, is not only a pretty phenomenal business model, but um, women should know that of that $800 million that we spent over the years, actually uh, over 50% of it actually has been with the women-owned businesses. So women are already participating in areas that you don't see. Uh, but we see it already in the central office and throughout the clubs in terms of women coming into our workforce, whether they started interns or coming at the professional level. And we're still not as full as we like to be towards the top, but it is remarkably and substantially different than it used to be. Um, also in areas of the business uh, where we weren't before. I think you, uh, you know, we talked earlier, we made reference to the fact of us having uh, women in the assistant GM function. Yep. Uh, that was not the case years ago, and they are extraordinary people. Um, Justine, you uh, obviously, we, you know, you got some nice applause from the crowd when we talked about your experience throwing batting practice. What was that experience like, and uh, what was the response along the way as you, you know, went to Major League Baseball camps last spring training? Well, obviously, it was a phenomenal experience to throw batting practice to major leaguers, and I was really grateful for the opportunity to do so. And I think that, you know, really, it was international news, and the world responded. And I think the world responded because it's a story, you know, it's really our story. It's all about how girls and women love baseball, and they want to be a part of the game. And people can identify with that, you know, whether it's just me throwing. And if you look at me, I'm 5'6", there's nothing very remarkable about me. But I was able to live out the dream that many men and women have. And that, that's our story, is living out that dream. So it was phenomenal. I mean, I, I, it was just amazing to be on that mound and have a bucket of pearls next to you and just start throwing. And I was really grateful for it. Uh, what do you hope to build on from that experience? Well, my organization, Baseball for All, is a nonprofit that gives meaningful opportunities, especially for girls. So for me, it's a matter of showing girls and women that their dreams are worth following, you know, and then providing them the opportunities to follow those dreams. And that's what I'm doing now. You know, it's, it's a very simple message in that if you, if you tell a girl she can't play baseball, what else will she believe she can't do? And that's why Baseball for All is there, to create those tournaments and those teams and those programming and just advocate for them. And because we all know women love baseball. They're filling up the fans and we just want to get them involved as much as possible. Um, Leslie, uh, who are some of the more influential women in the game that maybe we don't know about? Well, there's a lot of them, um, and I guess one I would start with is probably on the umpiring side, a woman by the name of Amanda Clement, who umpired um, baseball games all over the Midwest right back at the turn of the last century for um, over 15 years um, as the first a female umpire that came along and that's certainly a story and unfortunately in that particular we haven't had a whole lot of them over the course of baseball but I think her story is a fascinating one um, the other one that always fascinates me is Alta Weiss who's from a small town in Ohio who played baseball um, again at about the turn of the century she started in 1897 and continued to play till 1922 um, and she used her opportunity to play and she pitched she played first base third base to put herself through school not just undergraduate but she went on to become a doctor and that's how she paid for schooling was playing baseball her father no kidding found an opportunity realized how good she was he actually bought a team and renamed it for her so she could go and play and she played all over the midwest and the eastern corridor 
back in the 19-teens and 1920s. So those, those are just two examples of many stories that are out there. What can we do to continue to sort of spread those stories and get people to know more about these tremendous pioneers? Well, I think the educational role is, is the, the opportunity to get these, these kinds of opportunities to put the word out there through the schools, to continue to encourage people to research these stories, write about them, uh, to allow young girls to hear these stories, to uh, realize that the opportunities are out there. But I think we have to take that lead role ourselves and publicize these stories, both past and present and not allow the current stories to also get lost. There's lots of women out there playing baseball right now, and those stories also need to be told, and we need to find educational opportunities, media opportunities, writing about these kinds of things on every chance that we get. Uh, I'll, I'll ask this to Justine, but it's open to, to, to everyone here. Here's you know, kind of the, the hot button question. Will we see a woman playing at the major league level in the next, you know, in our lifetime or maybe in the next, you know, 25 years? Well, for me, in my heart, I need to believe that will happen. Um, but I'm going to put my money on a left-handed knuckleballer. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that one. Um, I think that's the, the one opportunity where there's going to be a chance to see that happen. Being in the commissioner's office, you have a really wide perspective of the game, what's going on on the field as well as in the business office, what's happening in the pipeline of our academies, uh, who's in the internship pool and so forth. And th there's a remarkable group of people, uh, women, also people of color, that are coming to the game really, really with very strategic designs. Uh, more than just having a passion for the game, more than just having a know-how for the game, but coming in with a real serious agenda about career and career impact. And I think as more of those folks are uniquely positioned uh, to make those uh, kind of differences, I think anything can happen. Um, the experience that I had just this morning was, if you haven't had a chance to visit yet, go by the Negro League Museum exhibit. And today, uh, the, the exhibit is a little bit different than it has been in past years. And so today I saw something that was a wonderful surprise, and it was Tony Stone's image being at the front of the door. So that would be the first Negro League player that you would see. And it caused me to pause that I was standing there sort of in the shadow of in, re in reverence to Tony Stone, uh, one of the few women who played in the Negro Leagues and played very successfully. And knowing that on the other end of um, this hall, uh, Major League Baseball has an uh, exhibit in a booth, and it's called the Diversity Summit. And if you go there, you'll find out that on July 24th in Chicago, we have an extraordinary event opportunity to meet with all 30 of our clubs our 10 minor league clubs, MLB.com, MLB The Network, about engagement, about jobs, about opportunities. And women are going to be strongly participating in that event. So it's changed already tremendously. And not only has the game itself changed, the politics of it have changed, and the mindsets of people participating have changed. So anything, I think, is possible. Uh you know, baseball obviously does have a little bit of a reputation as, you know, an old boys club. It's something that it's obviously taken a long time to kind of try to overcome. Why do you think that baseball, Major League Baseball, does provide a good opportunity for women on the professional level, you know, off the field, you know, whether it's commissioners or with teams? Sure. I, I think Major League Sports as a whole is pretty much uh, that same type of club mindset. But I, and I know I'm biased. But I do believe that baseball has a very American and global point of view. And to that end, has an expectation and has a responsibility, I think, to do things differently, to do them organically. And the fact that we have a legacy like a Jackie Robinson, like a Negro Leagues, like women in the game, that I think is a part of the DNA and the infrastructure. And Commissioner Seelig, if you were to wake him up at 3 o'clock in the morning and 
just ask his opinion about all this. He always says this, and that's why I know it's authentically how he feels. He sees baseball as not just a national and global pastime, but as a social institution with great social responsibility. Uh, so as the world changes and the demographics change and the needs change, I think we will accordingly. That's just how it is. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to happen tomorrow and not going to say that, obviously, our game is still uh, run primarily, uh, you know, by males. But um, it's changing. They are changing. And that's why I believe it's going to happen. Uh, Leslie, from your perspective, what do you see? What have you seen in your research, and and your and and even from students that respond to when they when they hear stories about these women that maybe they don't they don't know about? They're first of all surprised, fascinated, and then for many of them, it opens their eyes to the possibility of something they never thought about before. They didn't realize these opportunities were out there. They didn't necessarily know that there was somebody who had already taken that step forward and never considered the possibilities. So every time we see something like what Justine did and what and those are the opportunities. And for my students, that, that's really their reaction is, wow, I never really thought that I could do that, but clearly I could. And I think that's what we need to provide is that, that spark that says, ah, I could do that. I could make that change. And that's, that's what I see. Uh, Justine, kind of playing off a little bit of what, uh, what they just said, who is your role model you know, that brought you to where you are now, and how important is it for you to, to be a role model for, for young women who are you know, maybe you know, obviously younger playing, you know, and playing sports? And then we'll talk a little bit about softball and baseball and how that might also play into how, how we kind of end up with that divide you know, in terms of on the field. Well, I'd have to say I grew up wanting to be Oral Hershiser. Okay. You know, so I wasn't, I was probably 15 when I realized I wasn't going to be a Cleveland Indian. So then the idea came, well, why don't I throw it BP to the Indians? Okay. Um, you know, role models are really important to know that it's possible. Um, I did my dissertation. I'm working on women who are doing non-traditional jobs in Major League Baseball. And Kim Ng is a rock star. You know, every interview is Kim Ng's there. That means it's possible. So role models are really important. You know, for me, I consider it a great honor for, for anybody to look up to me, and, and I do all I can to serve through baseball. And, and I think that we need to continue to celebrate the amazing women who are involved in baseball so that both, not just girls, but boys can see what is possible and, ha and how we are a game for all. Um, you mentioned Kim Ang. We've had reference to Gene Afterman, uh, who is also assistant GM of the New York Yankees. Uh, so we have had several women who've reached that assistant GM level. Do you think we're going to see a female GM in the next 10 to 15 years in Major League Baseball? I do. I do. They certainly have shown that they have, when you look at Kim Ang, when you look at Gene Afterman, you look at Linda Alvarez, the abilities are there. We're seeing them coming up through the pipelines. The role models are there. The right opportunity, yeah, I believe it will happen. And you also have... This is a different generation. So you know how boys who have grown up with girls as equals on the sports field, in the classroom, um, you know, in college, during their internships, the males are used to having women around them and excelling. So there is an acceptance with this new generation coming up. And, and that's what it is. It's exposure and awareness and trust. And that's what's happening now. So it's an exciting time. Um. Justine, let's talk a little bit. You have kind of a new, you've taken on a new responsibility in the last year. You've joined uh, the Sport and Society at Northeastern as the Director of Sport Partnerships. So talk about that, what, that, what you do there and, and how that is continuing to enhance your goal of, of you know, more opportunities for, you know, for, for everyone in baseball. Right. Um, well, my mission is really to help people through baseball. You know, I love education, I love baseball, and I love helping people. So. It's so amazing that I was able to accept this role of sport and society. And two main things that we do with baseball is we run diversity training programs for the front office, for players, for coaches, so that they understand that baseball is not just an American game, but it's a global game, and how to work with everyone involved. The second thing that we do that's really exciting is that I'm able to go to spring training and talk to minor leaguers and, and help them with their college degree completion. 
So a lot of players, they get drafted when they're in their junior year, and maybe they have 12 credits less. And through the College Professional Studies at Northeastern, we're able to help them finish those degrees. And so it's really exciting, and the coaches and the umpires that we work with, the players, they're thankful because they love baseball, and now let's get a degree and move forward later on with their lives and do the, th do the other dreams they have. Um, Wendy, something that is new with Major League Baseball, and you and I have talked about it a little bit, is uh, the establishment of a new women's affinity group mm -hmm. through the commissioner's office. So talk about a little bit where that came from and what MLB hopes to accomplish through this initiative. Well, um, honestly, it's a work in progress. Okay. We really <laughs> just started uh, talking about it. Actually, we've been talking about it for quite a while. And I had the privilege of attending the last winter meetings. And the winter meetings has had a women in sports forum for a number of years. And there's no way that you could not uh, visit and participate in that room and not realize that there's a phenomenal resource and nucleus around having these thought leaders actually come together. And the whole idea of affinity groups or having groups come together who are networking strategically, coming together for a common cause, whether that's women, whether that's an ethnic minority group, whether that's veterans. Companies who do things like that have found a real return on investment in that strategy. Uh, because these individuals not only represent your workforce, uh, but your pipeline and your avenue to your marketplace. And women who work in baseball are passionate about the business. And so to deny yourself the opportunity to collectively engage with that kind of uh, thought leadership, uh, that kind of responsibility and reflection, uh, we think would be, you know, short-sighted on our part. So we hope this time next year maybe to tell you how we've advanced that. Uh, but right now it is a real live work in progress and uh, we hope more to come. When you hear about these types of initiatives that are even, you know, just in the beginning stages, as someone who's kind of looked at the game from a, you know, a historical perspective, what do you think is in store for the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years? Exciting possibilities of change, opportunities that open up the doors for anybody who wants to be involved, as it should be. Baseball is a, one of those ga games that has so many different elements to it that allow anybody to get involved, and that's what we're beginning to see is the opening of those doors to allow anybody who has the skills, the right skill sets, the passion for to have that opportunity. Um, and these are the kinds of things that are opening those doors. What about you, Justine? What do you think? I mean, what do you, what do you hope to see and what do you think we're going to see both on and off the field for women in baseball in the next, you know, 20, 30 years? I think opportunity. You know, opportunity within Major League Baseball to go up the ladder, which I know um, Wendy is working on to make sure that happens. And I know that, um, that that's an initiative. That, that's so exciting to know that change is on its way, that a 12-year-old girl here really has the whole world open for her in the world of baseball. And then on the field, I would like to see more girls' baseball programs throughout the country so that they have the equal opportunities with the boys and so that they grow up playing this game and um, have, have that opportunity to throw the perfect curveball. There's actually another opportunity area that I want to express. We talked about it uh, in the beginning, and that are, that's the women who actually serve as our vendors and suppliers in the game. Uh, for me, the future for them is bright and brilliant because our expectation is that they not only really do this procurement component for MLB, but they are more than capable of doing it for the other sports as well. So as much as we want to see the enrichment uh, and the represent representation of everyone on the field, in the front office, also behind the scenes, that whole uh, procurement model is amazing. Uh, Major League Sports is a very high-end industry with really imagine, unimaginable opportunity. And so we hope that our pipeline not only grows, but it really also gives the launch and the opportunity for those women to also become those key business leaders in the other sports as well. You want to open it up to the, to open it up to the floor? Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for paying attention. And, and if you have any, any questions or anything you want to follow up on that we talked about, we've, the, the mic is open. The floor is open.
I was at that batting practice when you threw to the Houston Astros. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> you got a pretty good uh, response from the players, did you not? I mean, they were very complimentary about, I mean, it was all, it was nice to, you know, talk about it and it's exciting. A woman's going to throw a batting practice, but they really needed to have a pretty good round of VP and, and they were pretty complimentary if I remember that. Yeah, the players were wonderful. You know, again, you know, I wanted to throw BP so that they hit BP. And when you throw, there's a few things you want to do. For me, I was trying to throw a four-seam fastball right over the middle of the plate. And I wasn't trying to be too fancy. Uh, the second thing was don't turn my head if they hit a home run. So keep looking. <laughs> and the third was don't flinch when it comes right back at you. And I remember when I threw to the Indians, I not only heard the ball go by my ear, but I felt the ball go by my ear. Um, so it was a phenomenal time, and the players were just amazing. Uh, the Rays were a great example of, you know, Johnny Damon coming up and explaining, you know, just saying, this is a great thing you're doing. Um, you know, Sam Fold, Coco Crisp with the A's, he was hilarious. It was just a great time. And one thing I was able to do when I threw BP is I wore a patch for Christina Taylor Green, which many people in Major League Baseball know the Green family. And... Um, she was a girl who was killed in the Tucson shootings, and her dream was to play in the major leagues. And that's the dream of so many of the girls in my organization, Baseball for All. So to wear that patch and just remember her dream and to build from it. In fact, we have a tournament in her honor, a memorial tournament this Columbus Day weekend in, in Tucson. So in her memory, we're going to have girls from all different ages playing baseball. So BP was phenomenal. The players were just couldn't have been more welcoming. So I guess my question is, how do you transcend, you know, because I, I see little girls like my nieces play t-ball, but then they had to go into softball because the baseball wasn't there and wasn't available. Yeah. And I guess my question is, how, how are you going to work and how's Major League Baseball going to help to bridge that gap and try and make that available to these young girls? Because I think women's softball has just become a phenomenal sport, and I, I don't see why the baseball can't be in there. Well, we have a lot of girls playing through our RBI program. And whenever I attend the RBI World Series and go to the girls' game, they are so good. And those games are so aggressive and engaging. Uh, so I think that is just going to be a, a matter of time, because really the softball competition, like you said, is, is, I mean, it's pretty rigorous, you know, all the way and up to including, obviously, our Olympic team. So I know some women who don't want, who want to keep the distinction, the distinction. Um, I also know others who want the distinction not to be there, or at least have the option. Uh, my own experience with this is my granddaughter uh, decided she wanted to play baseball and was not accepting that uh, where we live all that was available to her was softball. So she insisted, and we insisted, and she ended up getting on the baseball team. She didn't stay there very long, um, and to me, it didn't matter that she didn't stay there very long. And to be quite honest with you, her skill set was not on par with her team members. And I told her at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's just about the opportunity. And you get to try, and you get to try out, and if you're not successful, then you move on to the next thing. But it was very interesting having that happen in my own family and realizing that it was a matter of determination, one, and then you have to have the skill set to follow. So as has been referred to already on this panel, the mindset these days is much more diverse in terms of what you can do, what you can't do. Uh, this, is also a gen this is also a generation who's very willing to challenge the status quo, regardless of what it commonly uh, said. So I, I think it is going to be very much a grassroots uh, kind of effort. And then institutions like Major League Baseball, you know, will take a look and, and, and re-examine that. But like I said, at the same time, women in softball, you know, fast pitch, I mean, those games are amazing. And I can understand why some folks want it to continue to stay, okay. but just that the skill levels uh, become so extraordinary that you can accomplish what Justine did. Every time I hear you talk about 
you know, doing VP. I've watched enough VP to only imagine what that was like. I personally, uh, you know, on live didn't get to see you uh, do any of that. But, um, I mean, it already shows you this agenda has shifted. So. It's also, I think, important to recognize and to continue to recognize that, that baseball and softball are two very different games and that they both have a place. And what we're simply talking about is opportunity and pushing inst institutions like the Little Leagues to, to not simply settle for, well, we have the softball team for the girls. That's where they should play. One of the big things that has to change, I think, is where the scholarship money is put in order to encourage girls to move forward. Because currently, there just aren't opportunities outside of softball. And so many of them will shift that direction simply because that's where, though currently we do have two females playing in the college ranks, um, Gaz Sailors and Marty Sementelli are both playing um, baseball currently in college. And so those are the kinds of things that will continue to push the opportunity and show people that the chances are there. But I think that's one of the big ones is taking a chance on moving scholarship money out of the softball ranks and into opportunities there. And, and have her go to my website, baseballforall.com. And right now we bring girls from all across the country to events who are often the only girls in their leagues for now. But my life's passion is that in 20 years that your granddaughter could just sign up and play girls baseball. You know, we also have a national women's baseball team. It's very exciting. We have a Women's World Cup. Uh, just coming in August with the International Baseball Federation. So baseball really is a global game. It is a game that's available to boys, girls, men, and women. But for the girls and women, we need to expand a little bit further. And that's what's happening right now. So it's a very exciting time. And I truly hope that your granddaughter has any, any opportunity available to her. And I, th I know that will happen because I'm going to make sure I give everything I have to it, my whole soul to that mission, and we have amazing people who are volunteering to make that happen around the world. Mine's not actually a question. I just wanted to thank you ladies for what you guys are doing at the ground level, the foundation you're putting forward that my daughter, and like you said, my granddaughter, my great-granddaughter can pursue what she wants to do, whether it is softball, baseball, and it can obviously eventually transform into other sports. And I just want to thank you ladies for that. So thank you. Thank you. That's right. Ask a question. Get a t-shirt. <laughs> yes, I need another t-shirt. <laughs> uh, do you ever see a professional women's hardball league? Lester, right? Yeah. Yeah, Wendy. ask the question again. A women's do ever, professional. Do you ever see a professional women's hardball league? I do. I do. I've, I've created a business model that would do so. So with the right opportunities, the right sponsors, right people behind, it could definitely happen. And the talent's phenomenal. And fans love watching women. You know, in Venezuela at the World Cup, two years ago there was 10,000. In Japan, two years before, there was 15,000 people watching our games. So it's a great sport, and I think it'll happen. Well, the model exists in other, I mean, when you look at Japan, you look at Canada, you look at Australia, those things are already happening for women's hardball leagues. So, so I believe it can, if it can happen there, there's no reason that that opportunity couldn't develop here uh, with the right sponsorship, those kind of things. But the models are already out there. The model that we see domestically is basketball. I mean, WNBA, it, you know, pretty much the same process. And it was interesting watching uh, when they were going through their labor negotiations, just how it's a funny way to measure the success of something in terms of being on par when you're going through some of the calamity sometime. Uh, but to just see how well that whole process now is organized and the level of play uh, that's happening. Um, so, you know, to your point, it, it is happening. Uh, but I think the WNBA actually is a remarkable model uh, for us all to follow domestically as well. Anyone? Um, Wendy, this is directed at you. Uh, in Where I teach in sports management programs, I get young women all the time who are trying to break into baseball and want to work in a front office. Uh, many of them want to work in baseball operations, but others want to work in the other areas of a front office. 
What's your, what's your advice to a young woman who wants to break into the game uh, uh, on that side of it? Mm -hmm. Easily. Internships, internships, internships. And start looking into them as soon as possible. Uh, consider that you want to do an internship while you're still in high school. Uh, but definitely start aggressively moving towards obtaining those in your freshman year. Because when we actually look at the profiles and the backgrounds of folks who are coming in more successfully, they not only have one internship now, they actually have several. So you have to be um, agile and flexible because your internships may not be in your own backyard. Uh, but it's, it's really how baseball's portal was done. At the central office, we have 90, as in 90, uh, people in internships this summer. Uh, two women are in my department. I've never had two internships in my department. I always have one, but we had so much. Uh, we had so many resources. Uh, we had uh, so many people wanting an internship, and we actually had people asking for an internship in the diversity group. So we can already see this happening. I'm going to do a plug for the business summit because every single club who is there, there's one position that all 30 clubs will have, and they will have several of them, and it's the internships. Uh, so you go to mlb.com uh, backslash diversity summit and register and join us uh, July 24th in Chicago. And even if that young lady is in high school, you should come anyway. Because if someone had taken me to sort of school on the business of baseball when I was in high school. Maybe I still would have ended up just where I am, which I'm very pleased about. But what a remarkable opportunity to hear comments from the commissioner, meet other owners, talk to MLB personnel, find out what is licensing, what is sponsorship, what is baseball operations, how does international work. I mean, can you imagine at a young age being imparted with that kind of information? So. Uh, the short answer is internships. The long answer is come to the business summit. I would just add to that, if I could, the idea of mentors as well, finding individuals that they can follow, they, they can make contact with, learn about, understand, and have those opportunities. I think that's another component of the same thing. And, and I would add just personally what I've done is I was 16 when I decided that I was going to get a PhD. I'm a lot older now, but I'm almost there. But I wanted that PhD because at 16, I decided I wanted to be a college baseball coach. And the first person I told that to, who was one of my heroes, one of my male, my, one of my coaches, laughed at me. And he said, a man would never listen to a woman on a baseball field. And I just, I decided not to listen to him. I just didn't think that was a good reason. So I thought, well, I'm going to get a PhD because I don't have the same opportunities men have playing. But I can at least out-educate almost every guy in the room. And so that was a goal that I started. You said high school at 16, and I started learning how to coach at 16 immediately. Camps, books, videos, everything I could do to prepare myself and then push forward. And I can also add to this as well, because I've had a kind of a, an interesting experience myself. I, I went to law school because I was going to be the first commissioner of a major league sport. And along the way, I realized that what I really wanted to do was go back to my original passion, which was writing as a sports writer. And I can also tell you that along the way at ESPNW, I've had the opportunity to, and the privilege really, to interview a lot of very, very successful women on the business side of sports, Wendy included, as well as, you know, across different sports. And that's one of the questions I ask them. What advice do you have for women who are interested in getting into the sports business, whether it's baseball or tennis or whatever it might be? And the one thing that pretty much all of them respond is that it's not enough to just be a fan. It's not enough to just have the passion. Because let's face it, everyone has the passion. If you're even thinking of going that way, everyone has the passion. You need to bring a skill set. Be a little more focused in what it is that you want to. As, as Wendy said, learn about licensing, learn about marketing, learn about sponsorships. I mean, again, I wouldn't say go to law school so you can eventually become a sports writer, although my legal skills as a writer definitely play in every, every day. Having said that, you know, whether, whatever it is that, you, what, can, what, can, what can your daughter or what can your, your niece or what can your, what can, can they add value to the, what's the business proposition that they're, that they're delivering, whether it's as an intern or as an administrator or a coordinator or whatever it might be. Add value. Become a valuable member of that team and, you know, that's where it goes. And getting in the door is, is, the, is the first step, but 
taking that opportunity and to the next level and really proving that you, you have that, not just the passion, but the knowledge, the skill, the particular skill set that helps deliver value is so important. And that's something that, again, if I had had that, if I'd had that advice 20 years ago, I mean, who knows where I'd be today. But um, it is one of those. And that's something that I hear from every woman that I speak to who's, what, and who, they've all been there. You know, they all started at, you know, I mean, you started in HR at the Cubs. Mm -hmm. You know, we've all, you know, we've all had experiences that we can build upon that. And again, I think to, to Leslie's point, mentorships are so important. Finding a woman or a man, right. you know, finding a, someone who can coach you or give you advice along the way. I mean, I find I've become a little bit of that as well. I get emails, Allison, I'm sure you do too. I get emails every day. I'm graduating with a journalism degree. I'm graduating with a marketing degree. I'm in sports management. What can I do? How can I be you? You know, I always kind of laugh, but you know, you have an opportunity to share some advice and some wisdom, and that's the advice that I give. You know, get that, get that skill set, and then apply it in whatever that your passion is: baseball, basketball, football, the Olympics, tennis, whatever it might be. And to go along with that, to think, to think broadly, to think outside just the one or two jobs that they think are the ones that are out there, and to realize that there are so many different opportunities that will get you your foot in the door, give you a start. You may discover a different route that you never even thought about and thinking. So doing your homework, understanding that there are a lot from the writing side of things to the playing side to the business management. I mean, I'm a history professor, but what I teach about is sports. And I get to write about all those kind of things. And that's not something either that most people think you can do. And it's a way to stay connected. So I think thinking very broadly about what's out there as opportunities. I think. Nope. Anyone, anyone want a t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> While you're all thinking, I would also just mention to you, if you haven't had an opportunity to wander across all of FanFest, in addition to um, Wendy mentioning Tony Stone and the exhibit that's there at the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. Certainly to see Tony and, and the other women that played in the Negro Leagues. Um, there's also a booth with the women who played for the All-American League in yep. the 1940s and 50s. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's a part of the legacy that you need to um, wander over there and, um, and take an opportunity to say thank you to those ladies and to hear some of their stories as well. Um, they played for, from 1943 to 1954, and there's a lot of, a lot of stories there that are a part of the history of, of this game. I think. Well, while we're we finishing up, yeah. can I, I would just like to ask the others, if there is one final bit of comment or thought about this whole topic that you would want to share with everybody from your own experience, what would it be? For, for me, thank you, Leslie. It, it's going to take more than you realize, and um, without a doubt, you have to bring the skill set. You will have to bring your A game all the time. Uh, you don't really get a vacation around that, regardless of what you see around you. Uh, but in addition to that, hold on to that core component of you that makes you you. Um, my basis is my faith and my family, and sort of no matter what, I just know that's a part of my DNA. Find out for you what that is, because it will get lonely sometimes. Um, it will feel different sometimes. It will feel unfair sometimes. But most importantly, know that you are there for a purpose and a passion. Find out what that is. Nobody can do exactly that but you. And just make sure you bring your authentic, personal self. And another great lesson that I learned was treat everyone professionally. I would say, for me, it's two things. Um, you know, it's been very difficult, the path I've chosen. And I've had some pretty miserable things happen to me because I've tried to break down barriers in coaching and so on. I've had some wonderful things happen to me, but I've had some difficult things. And one thing that I learned was when other people are mean, be kind back. And for me, that kindness is not so that they like me, but it's because you need to create your own peace in order, in order to battle and in order to enjoy life. And it's been, um, 
it's been an amazing experience to be able to do that and not be reactive when someone is angry. Because usually when they're angry, they're just threatened. But to be kind back and, and be more uh, welcoming and, and, and have more of a joint idea that this is our game. And that really does work. The second thing is, you mentioned your family. I have a 14-year-old daughter named Jasmine. Everybody asks her if she plays baseball. If I back up, I started baseball for all because of her. I wanted her to be able to grow up and play baseball. So everywhere we go, we say, oh, Jasmine, do you play baseball? And she says, no, I don't play the game. I don't like the game. <laughs> and you know what? That's wonderful. Because the whole point is to be who you want to be. And she's being who she wants to be. And she has the confidence to do that, whether it's being a girl going to engineering camp, whether it's wearing her own fashion, whatever it is. And that is the whole point. It's be who you want to be, follow your dreams, and then go for it. It's very simple. Get that fortitude inside and go for it. Uh, yeah, I would just say it's finding what it is that you love to do. And for me, I mean, I've been a baseball fan since I was a little kid. And finding an opportunity and a way to, and not letting anybody tell me I can't do that. Um, and finding the opportunity to, I, I, when I got started on the baseball side of things and writing about baseball, I was told, well, that's not a topic that you write about seriously. And I said, well, why not? I had somebody tell me I could never write about baseball because I'd never been in the men's locker room, so how could I possibly write about that sport? And I said, but there's so much more to it than that. And so finding what it is that you want to do and not listening when somebody tells you you can't do that if that's what you want to do. Yeah, and I think, you know, I've, I've talked with, you know, even just during our little, you know, pre-meeting, you know, everyone has something to bring. Everyone has their, their own unique perspective. And I think whether it's, you know, on the field, off the field, behind the scenes, as a writer, as, a, as an executive, as a, as a historian, as an athlete, everyone brings a different skill set. And, and I think as long as, you know, own that. So I think we have just been given the... <laughs> two minutes. Given the two minute sign. So I think <laughs> that's probably about as good an opportunity as to say, Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for your questions. <laughs> really appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you so much to our wonderful, wonderful panelists. To Leslie, a little, one more round of applause for Leslie Heafy, <laughs> Wendy Lewis, and Justine Siegel. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, my pleasure.